the main takeaway I want to get from this talk today is understanding the importance of uh, measuring individual RNA isoforms to understand human health and disease and how we can do that using long read sequencing. So first, we'll start off with an example. Um, we have this hypothetical gene with five exons and five RNA isoforms. If we use long, uh, short read sequencing, our readout will look something like this, where you have the small fragments aligned to the different exons on the gene. This is great for gene level expression, but it gets a little tricky if you're trying to do RNA level expression, RNA isoform. For example, if you take uh, this specific fragment, it could come from four out of the five RNA isoforms. This creates uh, uncertainty in your measurements. And because of this, traditionally, short read sequencing collapses all isoforms into a single gene measurement, which is an oversimplification of the underlying biology. If you do uh, long read sequencing, your readout should theoretically, theoretically look something like this, where you have um, full mRNA molecules being sequenced at every read. With this, it's easy to quantify the different isoforms. We just have to count them. Now, as biologists, you're probably aware that theory and practice are not always perfectly aligned, so we don't get 100% uh, full mRNA molecules because of uh, current limitations in library prep, uh, PCR, and also RNA degradation some of these reads will not be full length. So next, I want to show you some data comparing Illumina and nanopore sequencing when it comes to reads that uniquely align to a specific RNA isoform. So here on the y-axis, we have our percent uh, reads that uniquely align to a transcript. And on the x-axis, we have nanopore and Illumina. For nanopore, the median uh, value was 50%, meaning on average, 50% of reads are uniquely aligned to a transcript, whereas for Illumina, the uh, median was 19%. This is a great improvement, and with this, uh, we can use algorithms to accurately quantify the different isoforms. It's still not the 100% we would like to have, but like I said, it's uh, very good for the quantification. Some other things to consider here is that there's a trade-off between um, throughput and percent unique reads. If you use direct RNA sequencing or direct cDNA, you get more percent unique uh, reads that uniquely align to a transcript, but you get less throughput. If you do PCR amplification, you get less percent uh, of reads that uniquely align to a transcript, but more throughput. So in this example, we did a PCR amplified sequencing. Now moving forward, uh, this is the experimental setup for the rest of the data I'm going to be talking about today. We used to help 12 aged human samples, six males and six females. We extracted frontal cortex brain tissue, and then the PCS111 uh, library prep, that is the PCR amplified library prep. We used one Promethean flow cell per sample, so we got pretty deep sequencing. And then we did the bioinformatics analysis downstream of that. This was our workflow, and the main step I want to focus on is the one on the right, where we used uh, Bamboo for RNA discovery and quantification. Bamboo is a recently released tool that's shown uh, Im great improvements in precision and sensitivity when compared to other uh, tools out there. And we use this tool to, to make sure that our results are reproducible and biologic re biologically relevant. So here in this graph, showing you the number of transcripts we discovered uh, for known genes. On the y-axis, we have a number of transcripts. And on the x-axis, we have a median CPM threshold. CPM stands for counts per million. A CPM of one means that out of Every million reads, one came from that transcript. And that was our cutoff point. We found 428 new transcripts for known genes. 303 came from protein coding genes. And 53 came from medically relevant genes. Then after that, we wanted to do a sanity check to see if our transcripts look, like, uh, look similar to the annotated transcripts. For that, we looked at exon junctions to see if they had the same canonical uh, splice sites as annotated transcripts. Here were our, resu our results, uh, where we have on the x-axis the percent of axons containing the splice site motif. And those results were very similar for our annotated and our new transcripts. Next up, now looking at the medically relevant genes. This word plot has the gene name for all the medically relevant genes we found a new transcript for. Here, the size of the gene name is proportional to the size to the amount of reads that came from the new isoform. So for example, for SLC to 6A1, 86% of the reads came from a new isoform, whereas for TREM2 on the bottom right, 16% of the reads came from a new isoform. 
TREM2 was really exciting for us. We are an Alzheimer's disease research lab, and TREM2 is a major Alzheimer's disease risk gene. So next, take a look at the TREM2 isoform. On the, here we have the transcript structure. In pink, we have the new uh, transcript we discovered, and in blue, we have the annotated ones. So it skips exon2. I was very excited when I found these results, um, and then my PI wisely told me to look uh, into this isoform on PubMed to see if anybody had reported on it. Happens that two groups independently reported on this in late 2021 and another one in um, early 2022, but it just hasn't been added to the ensemble annotation yet, so we didn't have it. So for us, it was a discovery. Another thing that was interesting uh, <laughs> was that one of the groups that worked on this is actually two doors down from me at the University of Kentucky, and it's one of the people in my committee. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I got to talk to him about this, and he was really excited about our work because he did um, PCR targeted sequencing on TREM2 to find this isoform, which takes a lot of work and a lot of time just for one gene, whereas we can obtain the same results doing now a gene, um, genome-wide analysis. Another thing that was striking for me was that, that in his paper, he found that uh, the TREM2 new isoform had 10% relative abundance, and in our paper, we found it to have, uh, not paper yet, uh, in this figure, <laughs> we found it to have 16% uh, relative abundance. So our results were really similar, showing that nanopore can accurately quantify this just as well as uh, qPCR. Next, now switching gears from uh, new to known, so to annotated transcripts, we looked at the expression of medically relevant genes in frontal cortex and how many medically relevant genes express more than one RNA isoform in human frontal cortex. This graph, uh, we found that 982 genes express two different isoforms frontal cortex, with 705 expressing two isoforms that encode different proteins that could have completely different functions and therefore affect human health in a different way. On the right, we have uh, 83, 83 genes with six or more RNA isoforms, and 16 genes with six or more RNA isoforms encoding different proteins. Next, since we are Alzheimer's focused, we looked at Alzheimer's risk genes. Here's 10 of them. Um, I want to highlight APP, which is the, the gene for the amyloid beta precursor protein, one of the main hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. It expresses five isoforms and they encode five different proteins. This is important because now we can test differential expression between Alzheimer's disease and controls to see if any of these isoforms are related to disease. Another one that was striking was BIN1 with seven isoforms and, sorry, eight isoforms and seven different proteins. Here's a more in-depth look at BIN1, how the different transcripts look like. In the middle, we have our CPM, so our uh, expression for all the different transcripts. And on the right, we have a relative abundance, so how much of the total gene expression come from each of these transcripts. We're also creating a website where you'll be able to look at this and perform gene queries to see which genes express uh, how many isoforms each gene expresses in frontal cortex, and we'll make this available whenever we publish this, hopefully soon. Clicker's not liking me. There we go. And then sort of the cherry on top of all of this, um, I don't have much time to talk about, is that we discovered 267 new gene bodies with a median CPM greater than one. So by new gene bodies here, I mean RNA that's coming from an unannotated region of the genome so a region where you don't expect to find RNA yet. We're currently working on some publicly available mass spec data sets from the same brain region to try to validate them at the protein level, and we're also doing some inference analysis to see if we can find uh, common domains with known proteins. Uh, we're excited to start looking into what these genes might be doing. Lastly, I want to thank everybody in the lab and all our collaborators.